and welcome to Library Lab Notes, the show that provides insight into all things information literacy in the sciences. I'm your host, Virginia. And I'm your co-host, Eric. And today we're going to celebrate Black History Month. We'll discuss some of the library's unfortunate history with anti-Black racism and talk about a few brilliant Black scientists and inventors. All right, let's jump in. We have a lot of ground to cover, and it's not great. No, it's not. Libraries are rarely talked about with regards to their active participation in anti-Black racism. The first ever free public library is the Peterborough, New Hampshire Town Libraries in 1833. So even if folks wanted to pretend racism wasn't ever an issue, the first public library literally opened alongside slavery and before the Civil War in the U.S., Libraries also absolutely participated in Jim Crow laws, i.e. racial segregation, even when they were overruled for a period of 1954 to 1965. In many states, it took many years to implement the ruling. Libraries would still close their doors before allowing Black folks in, or they would make the space as uncomfortable as possible, like removing furniture. Yeah, there's an enlightening quote from an article called a Brief History of Library Service to African Americans by Maurice Wheeler et al. in 2004. Although rarely covered in accounts of the civil rights movement, libraries were often the staging areas of enormous social change, sometimes with violent consequences. African Americans were beaten, arrested, and often lost jobs for attempting to register for library cards. <sighs> That makes sense, unfortunately, given what we've been talking about. As a result of all this, Black communities did form their own libraries and literary societies. From 1828 to 1928, more than 50 libraries and literary societies were formed by African Americans. For example, the Colored Reading Society for Mental Improvement, otherwise known as the Reading Room Society, formed in 1828 by William Whipper and other founders. There's a great timeline of some of the different literary societies on the WordPress page, Reclaiming Library by Lisa Fintram, that will be linked to in the show notes. That is so great. Yes, but... Oh no, I should have known. Racist white communities and institutions would still look for ways to make this difficult. For example, there was a successful Black created and operated library in Houston in 1913, but it was later disbanded by the city and reopened as a segregated branch of the city library, meaning that the institution found a way to control it to ensure it was controlled by white communities. Wow, that is definitely a good example of how deliberately anti-Black racism shaped things. Exactly. And I'm not sure if people know this about libraries, but one of our major library-related associations, even for Canada, is the American Library Association. It was formed in 1876, but it wasn't until 1970, that's nearly 100 years later, that the Black Caucus of the American Library Association formed to better meet the needs of Black library professionals. They pushed for things like stopping certain private schools from only admitting white students schools where ALA member librarians had been working. Really important work. We'll link to their webpage, but on it they talk about how Black librarians would meet at conferences in their hotel rooms as far back as the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this is a lot of American facts, but this history is reflected in Canada as well. Canada participated in slavery, which, why do so many people not know that? I know, right? Also, during the First World War, Black Canadians were initially not even allowed to serve until they protested and a Black Labour Battalion was formed. <coughs> Segregation. Yep. And at the same time, Black women weren't permitted to join the Canadian Red Cross and many other major groups. However, they found ways to contribute locally. Even while the first public libraries in Canada started around 1883 in St. John, Guelph, and Toronto, Black Canadians were still fighting to be served in cafes and restaurants as late as the 1950s and 60s. Oh, that is so gross. And while there have been many improvements, a census of Canadian academic libraries in 2018 showed that we were made up of only about 10% of any visible minorities, and only around 8% for support staff. And in a study from 2021, Yan Lee Lee showed that there is a significant pay gap as well. 
we still have a long way to go. Yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. If you're wanting to do some anti-Black racism research of your own, we have a good library guide that includes some keywords or search terms to get you started. See the link in our show notes. Totally. There's a lot more history on this subject that we could be getting into, but let's move on to something that we also need to be doing more of, everywhere and always, and that's celebrating Black excellence, because there is a lot of it. Definitely. We'll take a quick break and get right into it. It's time to talk about some incredible people. Yes, please. We've identified some Black inventors and scientists to share with you. Since we've talked all about the 1900s, let's start there. And don't worry, we have contemporary examples too. Yes, we promise. We have a strong engineering faculty here at the University of Alberta, so we wanted to mention Elijah McCoy, an inventor and engineer who was born in Colchester, Ontario, Canada in 1844. This person has over 50 patents. Which, if you know anything about the patent system, basically makes him a legend. Some of my favorites from his long list of patents are the ironing board and the lawn sprinkler. Which are very important things, especially lawn sprinklers when you're in a heat wave like last summer. Yes. Another incredible legend is Dr. Patricia Bath, who was born in New York City in 1942. She was a prominent ophthalmologist, a physician who specializes in eyes, and she invented laser cataract surgery. Which has been a huge gift to many people. In Canada alone, more than 350,000 cataract surgeries are formed each year, which makes sense as more than 2.5 million Canadians are living with cataracts. That is wild. I had no idea they were so prevalent. Right? Another incredible Black woman is Dr. Maya Diane André. She is a Jamaican-born Canadian ecologist known for her work in the mating habits of spiders. Currently at the University of Toronto, she is perhaps has the best Twitter handle of all time. You're going to love it, Eric. I mean, if it's spider-related, I've got to know what it is. It's Widow Web. Ah, oh, yes, that is excellent. Right? But also, more importantly, she is the co-founder of the Canadian Black Scientists Network, a leader in equity education, science outreach, and so much more. You can also listen to her podcast, The New Normal. Oh, yes, it's so good. Everyone should be going and listening. Another Black scientist is Dr. Tyrone B. Hayes, a professor in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley. He's known for his research concerning the herbicide atrazi. I'm always going to do some of these words wrong. Sorry, Eric. As an endocrine disruptor in the demasculizing and feminizing of male frogs. He is also an advocate for critical review and regulation of pesticides and other chemicals that may cause adverse health effects. Oh, and there are so many adorable photos of him with frogs online. I highly recommend checking them out and then probably also getting into learning more about his incredible research. Absolutely. Now, I also need to introduce you to Dr. Tyson L. Pankey, Assistant Professor and Associate Program Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion in Education at Duke University. He's a leading scholar in transgender healthcare. He is trans himself and is creating culturally responsive mentorships. As he said in a recent article, I contribute my first-hand experience and expertise in psychology to create a more inclusive and culturally responsive STEM enterprise. I wholeheartedly believe we can combat health disparities and advance scientific innovation through mentorship that can culturally affirm and empower BIPOC scholars. Wow, that's incredibly powerful. I see that he actually just put out a new article we'll have to link in the show notes. It's called gender-affirming telepsychology during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, recommendations for adult transgender and gender diverse populations. Yes, it sounds incredible. I actually can't wait to read it. Well, that's kind of a perfect segue to one more amazing person, and it's someone whose name we should be really familiar with by now. She is literally a hero. Dr. Kismika Corbett, born in Hurdle Mills, North Carolina in 1986, She is an American viral immunologist at the forefront of COVID-19 vaccine development. According to Wikipedia, based on her previous research, 
Corbett's team, in collaboration with Jason McClellan and other investigators at the University of Texas in Austin, she was part of the NIH team who helped solve the crinogenic electron microscopy structure of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. Her prior research suggested that messenger RNA encoded as protein could be used to excite the immune response to produce protective antibodies against the coronavirus disease in 2019. Her team then partnered with a little company, I think you might have heard of them, called Moderna, and the rest is history. Well, it's recent history. It's our history happening right now. Wow, that's honestly super impressive. Did you end up getting Moderna? I actually got Pfizer because I took the first shot that was offered to me. I ended up actually getting a mix of the two of them myself, honestly. Well, that's a great place to end on. We could have gone on and we've left out many great people in our lists and a lot of interesting history. So we'll have to share more on Black scientists, inventors, and history with libraries again. Fun fact, before the ice cream scoop was invented, people just used two spoons to awkwardly make scoops. The modern ice cream scoop was invented in 1896 by Alfred L. Crail. He was born in Virginia and later moved to Pittsburgh. He made his scoop after he noticed servers having trouble with ice cream sticking to serving spoons. His ice cream mold and disher was an ice cream scoop with a built-in scraper to allow for one-handed operation, very similar to our modern scoop designs. Now we're going to mix science and the arts with a reading from N.K. Jemison's The Fifth Season, Book One of the Broken Earth Trilogy. N.K. Jemison is the first author to win the Hugo Award three years in a row and the first to win for all three books in a trilogy. Take it away, Eric. A break in the pattern. A snarl in the weft. There are things you should be noticing here, things that are missing and conspicuous by their absence. Notice, for example, that no one in the stillness speaks of islands. This is not because islands do not exist or are uninhabited, quite the contrary. It is because islands tend to form near faults or atop hot spots, which means they are ephemeral things in the planetary scale, there with an eruption and gone with the next tsunami. But human beings too are ephemeral things in the planetary scale. The number of things that they do not notice are literally astronomical. People in the stillness do not speak of other continents either, though it is plausible to suspect they might exist elsewhere. No one has traveled around the world to see that there aren't any. Seafaring is dangerous enough with resupply in sight and tsunami waves that are only a hundred feet high rather than the legendary mountains of water said to ripple across the unfettered deep ocean. They simply take as given the bit of lore passed down from braver civilizations that say there's nothing else. Likewise, no one speaks of celestial objects, though the skies are as crowded and busy here as anywhere else in the universe. This is largely because so much of the people's attention is directed towards the ground, not the sky. They notice what's there, stars and the sun and the occasional comet or falling star. They do not notice what's missing. But then, how can they? Who misses what they have never, ever even imagined? That would not be human nature. How fortunate, then, that there are more people in this world than just humankind. Thanks for listening. A special thanks to our production team, Lauren and Jessica. Jessica put in a huge amount of research into this episode, so an extra special thanks to you, Jessica. 
and Lauren always does such an incredible job editing. We hope you enjoyed this episode in celebrating Black History Month, and we encourage you to continue learning and celebrating all year long. More fascinating and interesting science library topics and information are going to be coming your way. So as always, you can head over to our webpage or check out all the links and resources in our show notes. That's all for this episode, folks. See you next time. Bye! She was a prominent anthropologist. Ophthalmolo- no. Guys, I'm taking a drink and starting again.